Right. We're, we're going back in time 40 years. <laughs> Don't we all want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> all right, start over. Start over again. Do over. Now, most, most people here have come from what you might call a Celtic background in the sense that you had a direct experience of one or other of the Celts, Christian, New Age, Eastern, or otherwise. And I'm unusual in one sense that I've never been part of any Celtic group. And you might say, well, what are you doing here? What is your interest? And people have asked me that question during the course of uh, this conference. Well, I first got interested in the charismatic movement within the church as a young Anglican clergyman. I wasn't what you call directly involved, but I took an interest, I read the books, went to various conferences, and watched the phenomena of the charismatic movement uh, back in the 70s. And then for various, in various ways, for, you know, my wife and I became involved in a healing ministry, which in a sense was a successful one in the sense that people actually got better when we laid on hands on them and prayed with them. And obviously that meant we had to reflect about what was going on and what we were doing. And I wrote a book in 1986 on Christian healing. And when you write a book, people who you don't know um, notice you, and I got invited to be on a, a national organization called the Church's Council for Health and Healing. And that, as it were, was the beginning of my opening my eyes to what you call the shadow side of healing, which is the fact that healing, Christian healing, can be, and sometimes is, abusive. And out of that interest and concern came, uh, well, uh, there was another book in between, but the, my, main, my main, most recent book called Ungodly Fear, which is a study of abuse in fundamentalist Christian circles in Britain. And, and then Jillian, I think Jillian Jenkins had read my book at some point, and we contacted each other and we corresponded, and then she decided that it was useful for me to come to this conference. She said, well, you've got things to talk about. And I said, no, I haven't. Anyway, she said, she said talk about so-and-so, and I did. And I, I came, first came to Trieste in two years ago, and I was at Washington last year. So that's why I am interested in the whole subject of cultic groups, with, in particular, reference to the experience of people who've been abused by those groups. And then I came up with an interest this year in ostracism or shunning. And I want to tell just one short anecdote, which is lifted straight from, I'm afraid, from the internet, because I've got so many stories, but this one at least is shortened to the point. And some of you may know this story. It was about a Baptist church in, uh, in southeastern Michigan in the States. A 71-year-old woman called Carolyn Kasky was arrested in church just before the service. And they called it a trooper, came along and took her in handcuffs to the local lick, as we'd say in England. Her sin, or crime, according to her pastor, who's called Jason Burrick, was that was a spiritual one. She had questioned his authority. <laughs> Shock horror. <laughs> Other church members could not believe what was going on because she'd been a member of that church for 50 years and she'd stuck by that church even when it dropped right down to 12 members. And Jason Barrett had come in to help revive that particular church and, but of course, in his attempts to move it on quickly, he had, according to Mrs. Kasky, not followed the Constitution. Mrs. Kasky turned up again, having been released. And again, once again, she was arrested. I don't think she was actually put in handcuffs the second time. But the county prosecutor refused to hear her case. <clears throat> and she returned to church a third time. This time, nobody arrested her. But the members of the congregation refused to speak to her, turned away from her refused to pass the collection plate in her direction. Now, that story 
is not resolved. I don't know what happened because the story is told over a period of six months. But it's just an illustrative story of shunning or ostracism in church. We all know that it goes on, but the literature doesn't seem to focus on this aspect of Celtic church life very much. The power of the leaders, in particular, backed up by their congregations, to shun, disfellowship, excommunicate, or ostracize members that don't do what they're told. The issue is important not just because things actually happen as a result of ostracism, but because for many Christians, the threat of ostracism is a real one the whole time. It's an imp implicit threat to be part of a high demand group. And you must remember, I'm going to be talking mainly about Christian groups, uh, because that's where I sort of focus and where my attention has been drawn. So I'm going to talk about Christian groups, but no doubt most of the, those of you who have been part of other sort of groups will be able to fit your own um, experiences into what I say. <coughs> now, I wanted to set, start off with what I call a, the implicit contract made with counter-Christian groups. And this may be true of all um, high demand groups right across the board. A contract is an agreement between parties on two sides. The members of this group are promised certain things. And in Christian terms, that means they get a satisfying, rich social life. Instant friendship, instant love. They don't have to worry about all the struggles and stresses of friends because when they go to church, they'll be surrounded by people who love them. And also, they are promised something in the spiritual realm. They're going to have their spiritual needs met. And this will include, and I put that word salvation in brackets, it's a summary of the state of being right with God, which is going to exist now and in the future. And what do the members promise to do in return? They promise to tithe their income, in most cases, which mathematically means if you have a congregation of 300 and they're all tithing their income, somebody is doing very well. <laughs> and also a promise to obey the leadership. It doesn't say, as we do in the Anglican Church, that all things right and honourable. They just have to do what they're told, basically. And not question any commands or, or <coughs> instructions from the top. And then the black bit at the bottom, what happens when the congregation breaks the contract? And in Christian terms, the leadership will follow the instructions of Matthew 8, 15 to 17, about erring members. They have to be treated like a tax gatherer or a sinner. And they will be expelled. And the group is going to treat them as though they had never existed, i.e. ostracize them. Now this is a sort of generalization of what I think is the dynamic of a contract for people who go to a um, particular kind of church. Now you might reflect on the fact that treating somebody as a tax gatherer or a sinner, well, you might reflect on the fact of how Jesus uh, treated the tax gatherer and the sinner. One thing he did not do was to ostracize them or expel them and stop people talking to them. Now I want you to think in your minds about an example of ostracism as you have known it. And I'm sure you've all encountered this, whether in a Christian group or in another sort of group. And it's that picture, and as I say, I could pile example after example on top of one another, but I want you to actually hold a picture inside your heads as I go on and do my interpretive stuff. But since I came to this conference, I found uh, a video on YouTube um, and it was actually done by two people who were at this conference, Mark and Cora. And 
there was a very powerful description of the experience of shunning or ostracism by uh, Cora and when she attended her own funeral, her own mother's funeral, there was from her relatives what she called an evil stare. And that seems to me a very powerful picture. We all know what that means. And they treated her a bit like dirt on a shoe. Now I'll just throw those in, those two powerful images, which I think illustrate what we're talking about in practical terms. Now I want us to move from evoking our memories of ostracism and um, exclusion and shunning to what is now called social exclusion studies. And that says a recent branch of social psychology. And this means, in fact, that it's only been really been properly studied in the last um, 15, 20 years that we've actually got a literature which seems to take this whole phenomenon of people excluding one another um, seriously within the scholarly literature. Now, once we recognize what is going on, when pe human beings exclude, ostracize, or shun each other, we realize that we're dealing with something which is potentially an instrument of absolute horror, absolute destructive behavior. To cast somebody out of a group which they've belonged to for a very long time, like Mrs. Kasky, is an action of sheer brutality. And that can result in an individual's psychological or even physical destruction through suicide. And don't let us remember that many churches may not actually do the ostracizing very much, but they have the threat of it there the whole time. And the threat that exists in some communities, some congregations, is almost as bad as the thing itself. Now, there's a key article which is accessible to all of you, and as I say, it's on the handout, so you can look it up afterwards which, as it were, seems to be a, found, a foundation document in terms of understanding what social exclusion involves. It's, a, it's an article by Bowmanster and Leary from 1995, which you can print out as an um, open source document on the internet. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And then subsequent to that, a book from Kipling Williams, who is an Australian, who was an Australian academic who now works in the States, wrote this very powerful book, Ostracism, The Power of Silence. And then, just to make me feel up to date, I bought at great expense the Oxford Handbook of Social Exclusion, which is a kind of summary of the whole field up to 2013. Um, and even though I'm not going to quote very much of that book, I just wanted the scholars among you to know that I have tried to make sure I haven't missed anything vital out. So it's all very recent that people have started talking about ostracism and social exclusion in a, in a consistent way. But the fascinating thing is that apart from the, the odd reference to Amish studies, or the study of the Amish uh, community in America, they haven't applied any of this stuff to religious or Catholic studies. And that's really where someone like me comes along and says, how about a, to saying to these people, you should be studying religion, and saying to us, who are interested in Catholic studies, you should be becoming familiar with what these people are saying. Now, I'm going back to this key article in 1995, which is really quite important, it's extremely important, and everybody in that handbook of social exclusion studies or social exclusion seems to want to refer back to it. It's about 40 pages, but um, it's well worth reading. And what Bowmanster and Leary are saying in, 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 in a multidisciplinary way is that the need to belong is a fundamental human need. A fundamental human need which is more basic and like, more all-embracing than what all the things that Freud said about satisfying drives as being what human beings are for. It's also much more basic and than all the business about attachment theory, which says we all have to remember how our mothers looked after us. We have to be able to go back to that period when we're in distress, etc. 
And it's more important than, and, and Maslow, his hierarchy of needs, talks about the need to belong, but he doesn't really fill it out very much. It's left a little bit hanging in the air. And then also, the, the, the article talks about the evolutionary aspect of, of belonging, i.e. if you've got a, a hairy, hairy mammoth that needs to be killed, you need to get together at least 20 people and cooperate with them in order to do your hunting. You can go off on your own, you're likely to die of starvation. So this article brings together all this material from all these different disciplines, and its conclusions are extraordinarily important. And if we accept that the need to, if we accept the argument of this article, as indeed all the social exclusion people do, and they all quote it with, with approval, then we can see that if you do anything to somebody to take away their need to belong, then you are doing something really quite fundamental uh, against their best um, interests. And I want you to, to draw your attention to the conclusion. My conclusion is the mutuality of relationships, families and friendship, provide support, happiness and meaning for individuals at every stage of their life. And then this is the quote from right at the end, the last sentence in their article. The desire for interpersonal attachment may well be one of the most far-reaching and integrative constructs currently available to understand human nature. And that's actually quite a, a, a far-reaching statement for uh, an, an academic article to make. In other words, we're saying, this, the, this is really key to understanding an awful lot of stuff. Now, the book which I based the rest of my talk on is this book by um, Kipling Williams in 2001. As I said, he, he wrote um, from an Australian context, which is where a lot of the material, a lot of research was actually done in Australia. Now, and, and, he, and he, Kipling Williams is also a contributor to that great big book I mentioned at the beginning, the Oxford um, study on um, social exclusion. Now, these are the three points which I, I, I want, just wanted to take in. Again, I'll be giving this out at the end. The essential act involving ostracism is to treat people as though they do not exist. This involves such things as silence, that's part of his title, The Power of Silence, avoidance of eye contact, and talking over them. And again, in Kipling Witness's book, there's a complete absence of any discussion of this happening in a religious or kind of context. But he carefully identifies the emotional and psychological consequences of ostracism from reported um, cases of relationships, groups and firms. For example, he talks about a marriage where husband and wife didn't talk to each other for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> he also talks about um, situations of what we call um, where people, um, what's that expression when people um, tell on their, on their workmates? Um, whistleblowing. Yeah. He talks about whistleblowing in firms and how people treat that. He talks about, um, and also talks about it in other sorts of group. And then, of course, being a good social psychologist, he does lots of experimental work. Now, of course, you can see that you can't do experimental work on churches and cults. So his experiments consist of people throwing a ball at each other and leaving one person out and then examining how that person felt. And then they experimented with somebody um, taking in turns to be ignored for a week in a, in a university setting and some kind of also being left off um, uh, an internet discussion. Somebody said um, beginning of the week, beginning of this conference, abuse is when you treat somebody um, as, an, as a thing rather than as a person. And I'm just going to suggest that treating somebody as though that they don't even, aren't even there is actually worse mm -hmm. than uh, uh, worse than abuse. So I, I think I think we were talking about something really serious. Now, <coughs> uh, Kipling Williams in his book comes to what he calls a model. He he, he draws a model which uh, is his uh, basis for examination of his various experiment experiments you know, with the ball throwing and the cyber 
you know, contact between people. And he maintains, as a, a hypothesis, that ostracism has as its aim the destruction of four basic human needs. Belonging, and of course he is indebted to that article I mentioned, Burmeister and Leary, self-esteem, sense of control, and meaningful existence. And even if I say, even if I say absolutely nothing more, um, you can see that he regards ostracism as being a fairly full frontal attack on the human personality, which can have sometimes the result of their utter destruction. <coughs> and I just reflect, can you think of anything more example, or can you give a worse example of the opposite of human love? Now, I've made my own conclusion. If you attack any or all of these, you attack not the body, but the soul. I could add, you attack a person's personhood, you attack their spirit. And I would just sort of ask you to think for a moment, which is worse, to attack all those things or to knock somebody in the neck, break their nose and knock their teeth out? I think I'd prefer to have my nose broken and my teeth knocked out than to have to endure this particular form of treatment particularly when it comes in the name of Christianity. Now, the first one is belonging, and of course we've taken a brief look at the what Williams and indeed other social psychologists mean by belonging after that famous article. It's a fundamental human need. Now, a need is not a desirable outcome. It's something fundamental to our existence. If you attack a person's need to belong, you undermine their very being. And this is a quote from the book. There will be pathological consequences beyond mere temporary distress. You can see I'm getting quite steamed up mm. about this horror yeah. and of this behavior. So. Sorry? And rightfully so. Well, <laughs> and my comment, in a cult or religious context, the group may be the only belonging the person has ever had. And to lose it may result in their utter despair. And the second one I mentioned was self-esteem. Now, mm. Williams does say that all these four categories do overlap a bit, but, but he draws out these four distinct areas. And the thing is about um, ostracism, it puts a person, it makes a person feel that they're in the wrong they're being punished for something, they're not quite sure what. They might not have been made clear, they're just being blocked out by other people. And that sort of sense within themselves of their own inherent goodness is being undermined. And, and there's a sort of spiral, particularly over a period of time, of lower and lower self-confidence. And that's destructive of their morale and their sense of self-value. Now, control. Now, by control, that's the ability we have within each of us to, particularly to pick ourselves up when things have gone wrong. But I, the example that is given in the book is, is the example of taking a driving test. Now, if you take a driving test and you fail, most people will have the sense, oh, well, I failed, I've just got to try again next month or whenever. whenever. You pick yourself up and you have the confidence and a sense of your own ability to actually do it again. But if that sense of control has been taken away from you, you say, oh, well, I'm never going to pass my test. I give up. So to have a kind of sense of being able to do things for yourself is very important for people's mental health. Ostracism will throw the target. Now, that's a technical expression. We talk about sources and targets. I should have explained that before the target into a state of confusion because the boundary provided by other people's reactions to them are no longer available as points of reference. We don't know what people are thinking. We have a sense of, sort of kind of mist of misapprehension about where we are and who we are and what we're doing. It becomes more and more dense. And as I said, it's probably easier to have a fight with somebody because at least when you're fighting them, you know they exist and they know you exist. But if you're ignored, then you are um, unable to resolve anything at all. 
And I said to lose control because of the science of others is debilitating and will eventually lead to breakdown. In the now this is an interesting one, the meaningful existence. Silent treatment is effectively saying to somebody, for me, you are, you do not exist. Effectively, the ostracized person might just as well be dead from the point of view of the people who are doing the ostracizing. <coughs> now, I came across um, in my big book, Oxford book, this thing called terror management theory, which is actually rather interesting. It's saying that if, without other people, we would spend an awful lot of time being quite worried about our own death. But actually, other people, because we're in contact with other people, we are enabled to feel we are alive. In other words, when we're pushed out, ostracized, given the silent treatment, we're being, as it were, made to face up to the terrors and um, reality of death. And it's very interesting, the word Maidung in, for the Amish, I, I don't know what dialect of German it is, but Maidung apparently means um, slow death, which is an indication that they certainly expect the people they ostracized or shunned to die physically as well as um, socially. And so my summary of all that bit is saying that ostracism is a social death in an individual in a village, religious community or church and social death will translate into real death in some circumstances. It's pretty terrifying stuff. And finally, I come on to my conclusions. The placing of belonging right at the center of human need enables us to appreciate the horror of any action that would seek deliberately to destroy that belonging. And religious communities or cults, when they practice ostracism or shunning, are behaving with particular cruelty because the original contract they had with their members may have tied them closely to the group by isolating them from other groups. In other words, religious people are doing something worse than anything done in the secular world by when, uh, when they have this ostracism. At least the person sent to Coventry can go home or join, go to the Women's Institute or whatever it is they do the rest of the time. But religious groups haven't given their members that opportunity. And I've said we must all be sensitized to the appalling damage that can be caused by ostracism. We must find ways to help and support its victims by understanding the depth of the pain and the distress caused by this treatment. And I would just sort of say in, 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 in conclusion, I just found this new focusing in a, in a secular context on ostracism and social exclusion enormously helpful because it actually enables us to shout about it without just using words in a loose way. We really have a sense of the, of the, the research gives us a sense of the power of how awful it is and how we should be sort of moving, helping our lawmakers to see that Physical abuse is one thing, but this kind of, of psychological abuse is, in a sense, far worse. It ought to be possible to say that shunning, ostracism, disfellowshipping should become illegal on the grounds of gross cruelty. I don't know what we can do about that. Oh. My final sentence I mean, we've got to find new and creative ways of neutralizing the appalling um, phenomenon of this shunning and ostracism. Thank you. Thank you very much.